So now things have really started rolling on Planet Gunsmoke as Vash the Stampede's identity has been revealed and will start to spread across the world thanks to the insurance girls, but mostly a new character we'll be meeting in Episode 9. He gets probably half the screen time of Meryl and Millie, but is almost twice as important. Still, we won't be reaching him for a little while longer. Right now we have to deal with the fallout of Episode 5 in the form of gratuitous English typos. Outside the sheriff's office in some distant town, the news has come in about the Nebraska family's capture, with a reward of 700000 being issued to the entire city of Inepril. Ignoring for a moment that educational flyer on the mining laws in Springfield? The actual reward poster for the Nebraska's is full of awkward English. Nebraska is spelled two different ways. The descriptions for the pair are less than helpful. I mean, I hear scholar, I think this. I hear macho, I think this. That? Uh, not so much. What really baffles me, though, is that Professor Nebraska is over six feet and weighs 62... whatever impossible unit of weight that is, but it should be pounds. How does that even work? Nebraska seemed to be a fairly tiny little prune, even discounting his enormous son. And even if he was that tall, how can he weigh 62 of anything unless he's like four foot nothing and bulimic? I refuse to think about it. So Vash is now treated as a hero by the fickle denizens of Inepril, and gets unlimited amounts of free food and gratitude for giving the reward back to the city so they can call in a plant engineer. Meryl still treats him like babysitting detail, however. She may have to accept that this is the outlaw she's supposed to monitor, but she doesn't have to be happy about it. Now this marks a small break in focus between the manga and the anime, and I have to say, I prefer the anime's take, where the girls are here to minimize collateral damage caused by psychos after Vash's bounty, and they'll be here for a little while. In the manga, the girls have come to meet Vash for a completely different reason, to retract the bounty on his head. That's right, in the manga, Vash is a wanted man for all of one episode's worth of material, and after that he can go scot-free. This is because the agency has decided to actually classify him as a human natural disaster because they realized bounty hunters pursuing Vash were half the problem and reasoned that you can't put a bounty on a force of nature, revoking Vash's humanity. He doesn't seem to mind, considering all the perks. Two things. A, I don't like how obvious they made it up front here that Vash isn't human. I prefer the slow revelations in the TV series that keep us guessing. And B, well then, what are the insurance girls still doing here? They say that they're here to keep him from causing trouble on his own. And while this is also true in the anime, the more they realize that Vash is innocent and other people are the problem, the more their role becomes more one of protection for Vash from the bounty hunters than repression. In the manga, the same realization occurs, and much earlier. In fact, after one casual conversation with him, Meryl is convinced. But since there are no bounty hunters to protect him from anymore, what are they supposed to do? Well, in the manga, Meryl and Millie just don't do much of anything after this point, apart from comedic relief, pinch hit in certain fights, and sort of act as plot devices by being kidnapped or something similar. They're just around, but there's not really a good reason. The anime's choice to delay Vash's issue of freedom and his revocation of humanity was a great idea, both to give Meryl and Millie purpose and development, and for the great emotional timing of that revelation when it does come into play ten episodes from now. Anyway, back to episode six. I guess I'm just lucky that these girls aren't too swift, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> I understand how you feel, but this is not the answer. You have to try to calm down. This mammoth is called the Flourish, and now we know how transportation works on Gunsmoke. The sand steamer is like a luxury cruiser and a battleship melded into one. It's very expensive, but outfitted with an artillery deck and a tall, impenetrable hull, so if you want to get from one city to the next without being robbed or dying of dehydration, you take the steamer. The merchants here selling... Check this out, it's the latest tasseled beagle! If I heard that right, tasseled beagles? Uh, and other goods, are often mistaken to be the protection for the steamer by people first watching the series. Actually, as we'll see in the next episode, it's the exact opposite. These are cheaper, privately owned little merchant vehicles, and they travel alongside the steamer so anyone attempting to rob them will get blasted to smithereens. I think little details like this really drive home how dangerous Planet Gunsmoke is supposed to be. People really are pretty douchey here. And also, there's a blink and you miss it appearance of Kite, this rapscallion, asking one of the crewmen on the steamer if he'd like some help but the guy tells him he wouldn't hire a kid. 
Kite. Who is Kite? Well, we'll meet him in the next episode as a stowaway. But it's a neat little detail the writer threw in here to have him try and get aboard the steamer through legal means first. I say threw in because if we're going by faithfulness to the manga, this entire episode was thrown in. But it certainly isn't filler. It just takes key details from other parts of the comics and shuffles them around into this new story. It also gave them an excuse to throw in this character. Wow. It's times like this I wish I could whistle. You could stop traffic with a body like that. Hey, goddess girl, would you like to go on a date, huh? Hey, I'm the guy who's in charge of this fine city. <laughs> hey, don't be like that. <laughs> hey, come on, babe, give me a chance. Hey, don't you know I'm Supersonic Sodom the Great? Huh? You know, with a name like Supersonic Sodom and all that makeup, I have to wonder if he wouldn't be more interested in the woman's bodyguard than her. Mm -hmm. uh, to be fair, his name was taken from a one-shot villain in a bonus throwaway chapter in the manga. So what's a pretty girl like her doing in a town like this? Well, she's the head plant engineer. Yay! <laughs> We cut to Vash pouring out some liquor on a balcony above the busted plant. Now, everyone misinterprets this scene at first, and I'm no exception. After draining the bottle, he remarks, you were just tired, before being surprised by Elizabeth walking in on him. Everyone just sort of assumes he was talking to himself or something, like he didn't feel like drinking, and it was just sort of a waste of a few seconds. But a very astute friend of mine corrected me on this when she saw the scene and said, "Oh, he fed it his booze, how cute! I asked what the heck she was talking about, and then it hit me like a ton of bricks. Vash is not wasting the whiskey, he's pouring it into the tarp suspended under the plant, which is believed to be used for holding water, or maybe some other sort of chemical that the thing feeds on. As you'll see in this episode, it's a living entity, not a machine. That means his remark of, you were just tired, is aimed at the plant, sort of comforting it for breaking down. This scene also adds a little weight to his upcoming scene with the bucks and beauty Elizabeth. Vash the Stampede. Age unknown, origin unknown, no permanent address, wanted for the murder of Count Lebanon Vasquez and under suspicion of Class G weapon damage. They will pay 60 billion double dollars for you, dead or alive. Vash has an interesting list of offenses, but you'll notice there is one murder in there. And that's especially striking since Nebraska's words in Episode 5 have made us suspicious that Vash has killed in the past. So this only adds to the suspicion through this Rev Not Vasquez, and it won't be explained until practically the end of the series. If you're paying attention and catch it. Sorry about that. I'll point it out when we get there. As for Elizabeth... I happen to be the chief engineer of the Marius Breskin Can Tackle Technical Industrial Union Work Dispatch Team. Well, okay, I did that tacky zoom there, but Vash is hopelessly smitten with her. And you'll notice he never says anything overtly sexual to her. He just sort of worships the ground she walks on and asks if she'll marry him. I mentioned earlier that Vash's skirt-chasing tendencies are oddly charming because he never comes off as a lecherous horn dog. He just really likes girls. And I have to say girls, I can't even say women, because that's not really how he sees them. He seems to know the facts of life, after all, he's an adult, but he treats girls more like a middle school boy who's just figured out he likes them and wants to hold hands and then get married than a grown man might. Trigun's director, Satoshi Nishimura, said this about Vash's strange behavior toward the ladies. Quote, he's not a playboy, he just loves mankind. If you think about it, I think you can make an explanation out of that interpretation. He's immediately friendly with children, and of course has no prejudice against women, or for that matter, men either. I'd like people to think of him as loving all mankind, in many different ways, rather than just being a ladies' man, unquote. So, by that logic, Vash has human instincts without seeing himself as human. Now, he doesn't really know what to think of himself. We're going to see in later episodes that he waffles greatly between seeing himself as deistically superior to men and therefore responsible for saving them from themselves, and a freakish monster desperate for their company and acceptance. Either way, he adores women, but in a manner that's halfway between romantic attraction and how we dole over a tiger on the Discovery Channel or something. It's strange, but it's really helpful to keep in mind when tracking his character development through the series, because it's going to go in some weird places relationally. I'm talking Oedipal weird. So Elizabeth asks Vash if he even knows anything about plants since he's on the observation deck. And being sort of a pathological liar when it comes to his past, Vash plays stupid. Elizabeth describes the plants as a Pandora's box that God has given humanity to survive on Gunsmoke, which is an interesting way of putting it, I guess, and then asks Vash if he'll be her bodyguard while she finishes work on the structure. Is there some kind of reward? <laughs> Don't worry, I will give you what you want. What I want? Really? Really? I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do whatever you want! 
Meanwhile, the insurance girls are looking everywhere for him. <coughs> and Meryl only becomes furious when she finds out he's been literally puppy-dogging behind a total hottie all night. Come along, Spot. <coughs> what? Spot? Where's the hotel? It's just up ahead. We're almost there, Master. Thank you, Spot. Uh, well, we did uh, find him. That is good, isn't uh, it? The two retire to a hotel room for the night, though to Vash's disappointment, not the same one. When suddenly... Something's coming. You're not playing fair! No! Boot knife! Oh, Danny boy, the pipes, the pipes are calling. Bash doesn't get to avenge Boot Knife's death, however, because the assassin retreats and blows up the entire hotel room. Huh? What happened here? This is horrible! Oh, hi. Uh, nothing to worry about. Go back to sleep. Oh my god, it's Bash's stampede! Ah! Well, it's not quite. Oh my god! But that's a pretty good scream, too. I'm glad that I took the time to switch our room numbers in the hotel registry. That's no fair. Thanks to the mix-up, Vash gets to sleep in the cold until Elizabeth goes to work in the morning. She starts repairs, and Vash admires her skill with the computers, although she tells him no one really knows what the plant is or how it works exactly. They just do the best they can to regulate its energy output. Meryl and Millie bust in to complain about the hotel explosion and tell him to leave the plant before his very presence causes it to blow up or something. Chief, there's a malfunction huh? in section number three. Gee, what amazing timing. No! Vash and Elizabeth race into the plant core to try and fix the irregularity from the inside, but run into a familiar little friend. Run! Can't you run? Vash takes him out no problem. You're actually kind of cute. What is he, a ferret? Well, he might as well be to the humanoid typhoon, which leads Elizabeth to lock him inside the plant core. I want you dead. Huh? Oh, are you after that stupid reward? No. I want you to die for what you did on Stardate 0104, July 21st, 206 p.m. You notice that Vash immediately becomes serious when he learns she doesn't want money, supporting that whole whiplash from comedy to drama and making it more natural. Now we finally learn why he's won for $60 billion in the story of Lost July. July was possibly the greatest city on Gunsmoke until, through some unknown means Elizabeth can only call witchcraft, the entire metropolis was leveled in a matter of minutes. For some reason, there were no fatalities from the disaster, but the worst was yet to come. 1,400,000 people became homeless and destitute. They abused each other, stole from each other, and despised one another. That's right. Because of you, I was thrown into hell. But I still had to go on living. For Elizabeth, that was 23 years ago. After her parents were killed by the mob, she only survived thanks to the shelter offered by a cloaked stranger with one arm. She has spent the rest of her life searching for Vash and plotting his death. And with that, she leaves the planet to self-destruct. Repent. Repent and die. Vash the Stampede. <laughs> Is there anything I can do? The citizens of Inepril start to evacuate the town, but can't help but stop and stare as the monstrous thing breaks down. If I were them, I wouldn't stare for very long, since the incident that caused Lost July was more like a big plant palpitation, so you can only imagine how much damage its violent death might cause. Speaking of which, that makes Elizabeth's actions horribly ironic, trying to take vengeance on Vash by doing the same thing he did, taking out an entire city. Only in her case, this probably would kill a few people if they don't get out of Dodge fast. Maybe they could pile into the steamer? I don't know. 